Hi, welcome to our third episode of Arcade Cuties. I'm Justin. And I'm Nyreen. Folks, starting a podcast is no easy task, but do you know what is easy? N- no, what's easy, Justin? Climbing a fucking mountain. I climb mountains on the reg. You're a mountain climber? Yeah, I've got my boots ready. I've got on a puffy jacket. I've got cute little goggles on for Piper so she doesn't get snow blindness, which is a thing. Wait, actually? No, not really. (laughs) (laughs) It's a bit. Because I'm imagining it. I know, but I'm imagining it. I'm imagining Uh Piper with her little matching puffy jacket and booties Mm -hmm. and little, little hat or maybe there's a hood on the jacket. Yeah. And her little goggles. A little cute face. That's really cute. It's it's adorable. I feel like imagining that just gave me instant serotonin. <laughs> Good. So yeah, welcome to our welcome to our mountain climbing podcast. We've been yeah. we've been getting it going for like the past three years now. Uh, lugging mm-hmm. up our equipment to every mountain. It's a little difficult right now. We've had to smuggle aboard some planes just to get to some really cool places. Oh yeah. But it's fun and we wouldn't we wouldn't be here without you. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We always got our our equipment walking sticks. But you know what? All all that mountain climbing has got me it's got me dang tired. Does it? Yeah. I figure <laughs> I figure since I am so plum tuckered out that we could take a break from talking about mountain climbing and talk about video games this week does that sound good to you yeah that sounds good to me actually yeah actually i have a game that i would like to talk about oh really is it resident evil because you know i'm like stoked about that no i'm sorry it's not resident evil what are we talking about we're gonna talk about celeste today Oh no! I know we're talking about mountains again. Uh, that's okay. I Except can live for with it. The mountains represent crippling depression, <laughs> anxiety, and learning to love the parts of yourself that feel the most unlovable and accept them. I didn't mean to laugh about that because it's very true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very genuine sentiment. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Let's talk about Celeste. No, it's. I mean, it's true. <laughs> That is what the game represents. It also feels fitting because of uh, it's Mental Health Awareness Month, and it feels especially fitting to talk about Celeste given the themes of the game. Yeah. So I guess just before we get too deep into it, uh, we want to give a little bit of a content warning Mm -hmm. just because of the subject matter of the game. So, And we also want to, you know, promote like taking care of yourself. So if you don't feel up to it this week, uh, we will be discussing depression and anxiety. If you want specifics in the game, there are like panic attacks and and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we may get into a little bit of our own experience with those sorts of things too. Right. So if you need, if you need to take this week off, we don't, we don't fault you at all. Like take some time and and we'll see you in the next one. We don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable, and there is absolutely no obligation to listen to this episode if it's uh, potentially going to make you feel uncomfortable, unsafe, or perhaps bring back experiences that you may not want to think about. So Mm -hmm. do whatever you need to do in order to take care of yourself. That being said, I think we can get started, yeah? Mm hmm. Okay. I like in how in the last one, we sort of talked about our experience with with the game that we're talking about. So do you want to do that? I actually I actually was replaying through a bit of the game today. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's intense. It's an intense game. I played it on stream for the first time. I believe it was for free on Xbox at the time or at a discount. I had seen videos on it before. I had seen folks playing it before. And I had heard really, um, just really good, good things about it. Uh, The reception for the game was 
definitely what played a role in me finally playing it as well as just seeing like how it was like put together like visually i found it very visually appealing Mm -hmm. i also really like platformers and it looked like a lot of fun also actually before i even played the game i had heard the soundtrack because i was putting together a playlist and had been suggested like a song off of the soundtrack and then like that song enough listen to the entire soundtrack and for a little bit didn't even realize it was from celeste until mm-hmm. i was playing celeste and then went wait <laughs> <laughs> um i played it on a stream for the first time and it was a really good experience playing on a stream it's a really well-paced game it's challenging but not so much so that you get frustrated and need to I don't know, switch games or take a break. Right. The music is phenomenal. The story is really well written and touching. I found Madeline's journey really relatable, Mm -hmm. as well as uh, her experiences with dealing with other characters who were also going through their own issues. It's... It's a really good, it's a good game and it's really fun and it has really good replay value. I'm just going to say that you, you could go through it mm-hmm. over and over again. Did you play it on the stream? No, this is one of the handful of games where I think I've had a mostly, if not totally offline experience with, um, kind of like you, I had heard really, really good things about the gameplay and mechanics and like how much the story meant to people personally. Um, I watch a lot of like Polygon videos and stuff. Um, And so there were a ton of just articles and videos that just really nailed home how special this game is. Um, And so it was something I had been wanting to check out forever. And I think it eventually went on sale on Switch. And so I got it for that. And I played through it like during Christmas break or something, which is really nice because, you know, it's set on a mountain and there's like snow everywhere and you don't get that in Texas. So it's like my little winter escape. Um, And then, of course, like no sooner had I bought the game than it was uh, made available for free on the Epic Games Store. But yeah, I, I played through... All of the main story, I have not gotten into the core. I'm I'm trying to get some of the like unlockables and stuff right now, uh, and I have not touched the DLC, which we'll get a little into, but I don't want to I don't want to spoil for folks. Okay, cool. Yeah, I I actually didn't realize that there was a DLC. I'm I'm replaying it right now, so I'm definitely gonna go back to my replay and go right through that, and then probably play the DLC immediately after. Celeste, if you are not familiar with it, um, which hopefully you will be by the end of this episode and you'll want to play it, uh, released in 2018, like Nyreen mentioned, it is a platformer with a very retro aesthetic uh, and mechanics, honestly, in, in a very like strong and, and tight way. Um, It was based on a 2016 Pico 8 game that was created as part of a game jam competition by Maddie Thorson and Noelle Berry, who are two game developers who have worked on a couple different things that you probably heard of. Their biggest success prior to Celeste was uh, Towerfall Ascension, which is like a multiplayer. It's a a lot of fun. Uh, And I would also highly recommend that because it's just a real good time. It's like competitive and stuff uh fun fact you can find the uh pico 8 game which is even more like even even tinier right and even more adorable you can find that game in the game of celeste and i think you unlock it like once you beat the game totally so you can play the original version it had the same name and then that 2016 concept was adapted uh, over the course of two years to get the celeste that we know today There was a free DLC patch uh, in 2019 that added an additional chapter that was titled the Farewell Chapter. It's essentially a story about a girl climbing a mountain as a means of overcoming her self-doubt and anxieties. It's a platformer. 
each level is unique and adds a new game mechanic that, you know, you kind of have to figure out through trial and error. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you could dash, you could jump on things that launch you. There's <laughs> quite a few points in the game where, like, you need to build up momentum to get through certain parts of the level. And <laughs> it is chaotic. Mm-hmm. But it's really fun, and it's really, really, really satisfying when you get through uh, some of the more difficult parts of the game. I'm trying to be a little bit vague because I want to leave it as a surprise for folks who may want to play it. It's a really good platformer. And would you say it has little puzzles in it? Because you yeah. got to figure out certain patterns. For sure. So, like... It's it's essentially an obstacle course that you navigate right. through air dashes and double jumps and climbing mm-hmm. and all this all this fun stuff. Yeah, and occasionally sometimes objects in the environment that help boost you or launch you or you can direct them in a certain direction <laughs> so that you can meet your end goal. Yeah. And so those are those are like the core mechanics that will stick with you. Um, you'll eventually gain like new abilities throughout the course of the game, but it is it's pretty simple in like a very good way. I can't remember if we talked about that last episode or not. Like the concept of simplicity being a good thing. Mm-hmm. It's comfy. Yeah. It, it's a it's a cozy feeling. I know you touched on it being what was it you said like kind of retro style. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely nostalgic and feels really easy to pick up. That being said, this game is hard as hell um, and can be very, very, very difficult to navigate, like especially later on in the game. It's kind of a build up to it, preparing you for the final level. Does that make it easier? No, but it's it's a build up. (laughs) (laughs) I'll say this, the, the game is very difficult at points and, you know, it has a, a little, like you said, there's a bunch of trial and error, but if platformers aren't necessarily your jam or like you find yourself stuck on a particular level or whatever, the game does have a built-in assisted mode, uh, which can grant you like longer climb time, invincibility, more air dashes, uh, and the game does not like hold that against you, which is very nice and makes it very accessible to newcomers, both to the genre and the game itself. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, you just hit the, you literally hit the pause menu and then you go down like two item or two like menu items, I think, and click on assisted mode. That's great. Okay, that's super fucking cool. I didn't know they had that. Okay. Yeah, the game in its base mode does like, track the number of times that you have died on each level, <laughs> uh, which can oh, be yes. kind of intimidating. Uh, but really, this game is all about like learning and fine-tuning uh, the mechanics and your skill set, just like rock climbing. All of that ties to like the dev, like the development itself. Uh, this game was designed to be speed ran. Is that... Is that, is that the correct speed, speed run? Ran, sp- speed run? It's very popular in the speed running community. Right. But you, even even from the like initial concept, like that Pico 8 version, Maddie wanted people to speed run it and like have perfect runs and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Throughout the game, you're going to meet a variety of characters. There's Madeline, who you play. That's the player character. She's making her way up this enormous, treacherous mountain, coming to terms with parts of herself that she's been ignoring. Yeah, you kind of you kind of don't really know her backstory for a good portion of the game. Right. Like, you get the impression that maybe she just broke up with someone recently. Like, there's... Because she's, like, checking her phone and stuff, right? Right. Or perhaps maybe... Like a family member or something. Yeah, left, like, an abusive situation. Right. Or something. But she desperately wants to do this because she feels like she needs to prove herself. Mm-hmm. 
to herself, but also perhaps others as well who have doubted her. And she's kind of, mm-hmm. it's kind of a thing that happens through the game where she's like repetitively like fed up with people telling her like, oh, you shouldn't do this. And folks uh, kind of telling her she's biting off more than she could chew. And she's just fed up of feeling like she's not good enough and she's not capable and having other people doubt her. Yeah. So that's how she an- ends up at the mountain uh, that is named Celeste. Mm-hmm. So along the way, she meets a variety of folks. So the first person she meets is this old woman at the bottom of the mountain who lives there. And Madeline approaches her. They start a conversation. And Madeline says to her, oh, maybe you should fix your driveway. Like, I almost hurt myself seriously going through it. And the older woman's response to that is, wow, if my driveway almost did you in, I don't know how you're going to survive that mountain. So that's the beginning of people being like, <laughs> telling her like, oh, I don't know if you could do it. Are you sure? It's going to be it's going to be tough. Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah. I think she just goes by like, I think she's literally just called old woman. Like Madeline, like, just kind of brushes her off as this like, it's just a, it's just a weirdo who lives in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. But yeah, she's good. I like her. She's funny, too. Another character that Madeline meets is Theo. He's another person that's climbing the mountain. He's an aspiring photographer who's trying to gain followers on his social media and sort of live up to his grandfather, who was a pretty well-known photographer, according to him. And he's not quite sure if he could do that or not, but he's trying his best. He's very supportive of Madeline from the start. Uh, Sweet looks out for her. Kind of a himbo. Yes, absolute himbo vibes. Absolute himbo vibes. (laughs) Constantly taking photos for, I think it's called Instaflex in the game, (laughs) like their version of Instagram. Uh Madeline doesn't care for him much at first because he's got like, he's got big jock energy big jock himbo like nice and loud and uh he's just he's a sweetheart i love theo Mm -hmm. but but he does he helps a lot like both in in madeline's personal growth and like the uh course of the the game right he's a good egg and on the on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of friendliness uh you got mr oshiro who runs the hotel like on the mountain oh my gosh he is i you know i wouldn't say he's on the opposite end of friendliness he is friendly but so deeply it's kind of emotionally manipulative right he absolutely is emotionally manipulative it's kind of sad but Oh, my God, Mr. Oshiro is just sad. I don't think this this spoils too much. Uh, the, the mountain has, like, mystical properties to it, right? Like, all kinds of weird things happen. Right. Because the mountain itself is trying to better the people that are on it. Uh, so, Mr. Oshiro is a ghost. Uh, and so, he has a lot of, like, the emotional baggage and... Uh, unfulfilled desires and all that stuff uh, that he carried throughout his life uh, and into his afterlife. Right. And so he kind of he kind of uses that um, much to Madeline and the player's annoyance for for the the hotel section of the game. Right. I think the chapter of Mr. Shiro is one of the heavier ones, but that may be my personal take on it Mm -hmm. because i know folks who behaved a lot like him so for me having those interactions with him in the game between madeline and him reminded me of those situations right he's very lost and very hurt and doesn't want to reflect on how he's absolutely causing his own pain right he is not a bad guy and he's not like the no antagonist of this game there's not really there's not a traditional antagonist i would say Mm -hmm. 
He's not an antagonist and he's not a bad person, but he does bad things. Yes. There's no character in this game that's a bad person. They're all very human Mm -hmm. and, you know, humans are complicated and have issues and then those issues go unresolved if people don't want to grow, they don't want to hold themselves accountable, they don't want to find help for whatever it might be that manifests in really unhealthy ways, like really bad coping mechanisms or defense mechanisms. Which is kind of the perfect transition to our final character on the mountain. Yes. (laughs) The final character in the game is Madeline, who is a manifestation of Madeline's Anger, anxiety, Mm self-doubt, among other things. She is constantly talking down the Madeline, discouraging her, telling her to go home, telling her that she isn't worth anything, reminding her that she makes mistakes, and just overall has the attention that make her feel bad. And other characters like right. Theo oh, and yeah. Mr. Oshiro can see her and she is like constantly egging them on as well. Right. Throughout the course of the game, as you encounter her, it is very easy uh, to think that, oh, you know, this is just like a shadow version of Madeline that has to be conquered or like destroyed or whatever, you know, like if you, if you think about it, like Shadow Link in Legend of Zelda or literally any game where you have an evil doppelganger right right but like we like we said were you paying attention there's no bad guys in this game no there's no bad guys Madeline also has like her own wants and desires and insecurities and hurt like i think that is the the biggest thing that drives her you you encounter her first like in a mirror that shatters and releases her and a lot of the dialogue is focused on battling confronting madeline for you know trying to shut that portion of her out right trying to ignore those parts of her and get rid of her and so it's kind of it's kind of tragic like it's very sad and i i think that is where like the emotional crux of the game is like as you progress you you feel more and more for battling and you just you want the two to like reconcile together peacefully Mm -hmm. it is the uh internal mountain that that madeline has to overcome it's just coming to terms with and accepting battling as part of her right yeah I think battling kind of represents all the parts of someone that feel really unlovable Mm -hmm. and ugly. Not that those parts are ugly. It's just as someone who also struggles with mental health, it's hard not to see those parts of yourself as ugly or lazy or you're not trying hard enough or you know what I mean? Like it's, that's kind of what Madeline is for Madeline. Right. She's all the parts of her that feel really unlovable. And a big part of the game is Madeline going through a lot of growing pains and coming to terms with that part of herself and learning that she's still lovable. She's still a person, Mm -hmm. even when she doesn't feel her best. Right. And accepting that. And I I think in other games, where that kind of like symbolism is more apparent, right? When you have this splitting of the uh, the main character, it's usually very easy or very common for that split representation to be grotesque or like, you know, physically right. ugly or altered in some way. But Badalyn is not that it's it's literally just a palette swap kind of yeah like she's got the red eyes she's a little intimidating sure but like par for par she is she is exactly the same as as madeline like has the same dashing abilities and climbing and everything 
Yeah, actually, a part of the game is running into Badeline after she's been released from the mirror. And during those scenes, when you speak to her uh, shortly after a chase scene occurs where you have to run away from her, navigate through the environment and that to escape her. And during those scenes, she actually mimics your exact pattern. Mm -hmm. That is a, you know, because she is madeline yeah as much as madeline is her it's neat it's very cool <laughs> i don't know if that was relevant to say it just you were saying they're they're the same person no i think it it tracks and it's i think it's a sign it's a sign of like a good game it's just yeah. like your mechanics feed into your story and vice versa so yeah through, throughout the the game you're going through different chapters which are essentially you know different stages of the mountain that range in difficulty and aesthetic um very much like our <laughs> our hades playthrough mm -hmm. uh parts of this mountain look absolutely buck wild and scary and other parts are dreamy and you get you get these like little little, little interstitial cutscenes. uh that focus more on the internal struggle that Madeline is going through, like in, in parallel to the dangers of climbing a mountain. There's one scene in particular, I don't know if you remember this, it happens twice, actually. The first time that it happens, you are on like a tramway, uh, like a cart that's going up the mm. mountain, and it like starts to shake and stuff. And you're traveling with Theo, and Madeline starts to have a panic attack. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. So he recognizes what Madeline is going through because his sister also experiences that. And so he tries to coach Madeline like a breathing technique that will help, you know, bring her out of this panic state, this heightened anxiety. And so mechanically, that translates into he tells her to visualize a feather. And like trying to keep it afloat uh, with her breath. And so mechanically, uh, it is like gently blowing on this feather so that it doesn't fall like off screen and also doesn't blow like wildly out of the way. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> as, as I'm explaining that, I don't know about you, but I can picture a game where that would be like done with less tact and seem kind of, you know, it's like the pay F or press F to pay respects thing, right? Right. Uh, but it, it didn't come off that way to me, like as someone who has personally experienced panic, atta panic attacks and has dealt with anxiety for a very long time, like the way the team approached it felt very grounded and very comforting. Um, and and I, we, should, we should mention that like while we are on the topic of these mental health states and stuff that a lot of the experiences that people have are, you know, based on an individual level. Um, so like we can't, we can't, and we should not try to paint like broad strokes in any regard when it comes to um, the, the representation of mental health, I, I think. Oh, absolutely not. Everybody's experience is different. And mm -hmm. regardless of that valid, mm -hmm. even when we compare it to our experiences. Right. Because you, get, you you literally, you actually just can't compare mm -hmm. each other's experiences. No one's going to have the same one. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for me personally, like I, those, those scenes weren't even like triggering or anything of that sort. And I don't know how you felt about it, but. For me personally, my experience with the scenes, I found them very soothing. Mm-hmm. It also made me like Theo more than I already did. I don't even know if like the the relationship between Theo and Madeline is supposed to ro be romantic. I never read it that way, but like I I don't read it as that way either. Regardless, he is like a solid friend, and I do love their relationship very much. Theo is a good friend, and he's there for Madeline, but not at the expense of his own well being. Right which is refreshing to see. I'm glad they wrote him in like that as well. Mm -hmm. Someone who's kind and supportive and cares for her, validates her experience and wants the best for her, but also leaves room for her to grow on her own without needing him. It was really nice to see that. 
It's it's a it's a nice scene. And one of them, Battleline, shows up and interrupts that process and like causes the tramway to crash. I think it's the first one. Mm-hmm. But I also don't remember. <laughs> right. It's it's been a while since I like played through the story proper. All right. I was going to talk about the green haired person who is also referred to as Madeline's ex. Oh, I did. I, 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 <laughs> I was so confused. I did not remember that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think you brought them up briefly earlier. Mm -hmm. They don't have a name. They're never given a name. They only speak to Madeline at the beginning of the game. That's their only appearance in the game is when Madeline calls them to try and get support from them. And then, you know, obviously doesn't get it. And Madeline's like, ah, never mind. Right. The reason for folks uh, to believe that it's an ex is because of the way they spoke. Mm -hmm. But at that point in the game, when they're speaking, they have they had broken up. Mm -hmm. Fuck them. I don't know if that's a confirmed thing. It doesn't matter. <laughs> they're trash. <laughs> they're, they're trash. They're trash. Don't give energy to no. people who don't like take your mental health Support concerns you. seriously or anything like that. They pick up. And they seem bothered that she's contacting them. It's been a while since they last spoke. She mentions that Madeline always does this when something's wrong. It feels like someone who doesn't take Madeline's mental health and overall well-being seriously. It feels very heavily implied that... They think Madeline is just doing stuff for attention. They're, she's lying. And they just feel very cold, distant, unsupportive. And it's a really gross interact. Not, I wouldn't say gross interaction, but it's a very, it's a sad interaction. Mm -hmm. It makes sense for Madeline to sort of reiterate or reiterate or echo those ideas um because when you're in situations like that you know it's it's right easy to internalize those and like start to believe it about yourself too oh absolutely like it doesn't matter how little time you spend with someone that kind of picks at who you are as a person drags you down amplifies your insecurities and whatnot mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how little time you spend with a person like that stuff just stays with you mm -hmm. and it hurts that is another factor that madeline has to i keep saying come to terms because i feel like that is the best like that's that's the best place that you kind of end up at least at the end of the game right like eventually madeline makes it to the top of the mountain she combines with Badalyn, which mechanically gives you another air dash uh, and also changes the color of Madeline's hair. I just remember when Madeline tells Madeline that she needs her, Madeline's reaction is like just confused, thinks that Madeline is lying to get rid of her. And... But 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 Madeline isn't. Madeline's just finally accepting this part of herself. It 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 doesn't. The game doesn't paint mental illness as something that needs to be overcome or fixed, or you need to get rid of it or get over it. It treats mental illness as part of being human, which it is for a lot of people. It's a reality for a lot of people, and I like that because it doesn't make mental illness out to be this evil, gross thing that's like, mm -hmm. you need to like get over it. Yeah. And like it is a moment of like vulnerability right. and openness that Madeline shares that I think finally convinces uh, Madeline to rejoin her. Right. So they can work on it together. Yeah. And get through things and she celebrates with her friends um not as like uh yay my 
mental health stuff is done, but like yelling, yay, I'm no longer mentally ill. <laughs> but like now I'm in a place where I can like start to work towards that. Yeah, work towards healing and feel better about myself. Which could arguably be like an even a higher mountain. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, now the end of the the ending of the game is very cute. Um, there's a couple different endings which are dependent on the number of strawberries uh, you collect throughout the game, but it's nothing like major. There's not a bad ending. Right. Uh, if you don't like collect any strawberries, so <laughs> we just we just discussed a lot a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. right? This game is chock a block full of symbolism and metaphors and uh, more plainly written like direct messages. Uh, but but why 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 feature it on the show like? Like, other than the fact that like we enjoy it, are we are we getting to the question, the big, the big question of is Celeste gay? Yes, yes, is Celeste gay? Absolutely, a hundred fucking percent. So should we get into it? Yeah, we could get into it. So we can we can get into like the. Uh, story and gameplay elements that confirm this as well as uh, some developer notes and, and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. On a very surface level, I think it's easy to kind of look at this game as someone uh, who is non-binary and like see the issues that, that Madeline is facing in regards to her identity and relate to that. Uh, in terms of like my own gender identity and sexuality and all of that stuff, right? Right. And I think a lot of uh, queer and LGBTQIA plus fans latched onto that as well. And I, I think that from like a storytelling standpoint, that makes sense. And there were like definitely several very small hints throughout the story that that may be the case. Uh, but when it came to the Farewell DLC that uh, launched in 2019, we got a, a couple of more uh, confirmations. Mm -hmm. The biggest ones that we got were still like pretty subtle um, in the illustrated uh, scenes that they use essentially for cutscenes in this game, right? And a couple of stills that we see in Madeline's bedroom uh, where she's like communicating with uh, Theo. You can see like a trans flag uh, on her desk. There's also like a scene where you see like a pill bottle and so people were like oh is that you know okay so it's confirmed that it's estrogen yes okay estrogen pills um so you see estrogen pills uh also in the background you know it's very small but like people saw it and and so obviously had a lot of questions for the team that developed celeste right we would eventually get like a final concrete uh statement from Maddie themselves uh, in their blog, which is titled, Is Madeline Canonically Trans? Um, in it, they say, yes, of course. So obviously the question, uh, given all this evidence, right, and all this like fan speculation is why not, you know, make that apparent earlier? Um, and a lot of that ties uh, very personally with uh, Maddie's own journey uh, in regards to their gender identity. So mm -hmm. for, for the most part, when they were working on this game uh, in its initial development, they just didn't, they didn't know that Madeline was, was trans. They had like, like an inkling of an idea, right? And so I think that's why those story elements like present themselves. During the development of the Farewell DLC, uh, Maddie personally was like, oh, okay, I'm definitely going through something right now. And so that reflected into the narrative of the game. Um, and then post farewell DLC, Maddie confirms that yes, they both experienced this this similar thing. I would highly encourage you to check out the blog because it brings up like a lot of interesting points, uh, especially in regards to queer content creation and representation. 
because you know they 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 state that one of their fears is that they never wanted to like retroactively um make their game like inclusive or have rep- representation because that sucks right and then the other part of it is that how much of a responsibility does a content creator game developer etc who is queer how much of a response responsibility do they have to make their games have that inclusion and for maddie it was very much tied to the risk of you know essentially outing themselves which is very scary and i think you could make you could make the argument that like you know your your safety your boundaries like are where are where those lines should probably end when it comes to like a fan base right mhm to simplify it um they said in the blog that Celeste is a game written and designed by a closeted trans person who is struggling with their gender identity, scored by a trans woman with art and code and sound and other labor from their inspiring and irreplaceable friends. And that was the approach that they took. And it's just, it's a very beautiful sentiment. And I think that this game and its various like stages of development capture that essence and that the spirit of you know, coming to terms with and gaining a better understanding of your own um, gender identity. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to, uh, for lack of a better term, spoil it too much. So um, I'll make sure to include like a link in the episode description. But if you haven't checked out that blog, I would highly encourage you to do so. Since we just mentioned uh, the game's composer. I do just want to shout her out real quick. Uh, Lena Rain composed the soundtrack to Celeste, um, which I can't remember if we talked about earlier, but just the music to this game is so good. It's so pretty and motivational and just tugs at the heartstrings. Uh, But Lena has a pretty like stellar career as well. Uh, They've composed music for Guild Wars, uh, the Minecraft like reboot thing that they did, uh, I think when they went HD, um, they were a sound mix engine. Ogen- <laughs> they were a sound mix engineer for the Steven Universe movie, and uh, most recently composed for the game uh, Chicory, which is very cute, and I cannot wait to play. Was there anything else? Uh. I can go over some of the um, the speedrunning side of it. So if you want, I can go over some of like the world records and stuff. Please, I actually... Okay, so wait, I think... I think okay, I, I recently replayed through Celeste a second time. Mm-hmm. I think the first time I played through it, it took me like uh, nine hours, eight hours. Right. And then the second time I played through it, it took me like... Uh, I think about the same time or maybe six hours. So I'm super interested in knowing like what the record is for like someone beating it in one shot. Like, and, and that's with the entire game. You said you didn't play with the assists, right? Cause you didn't know that they were. No, 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 no. I didn't play. I didn't play with the assists because <laughs> I didn't know they were a thing. Right. Even with that, I I, didn't, I have no idea what my in, in-game clock looks like. So the world, the world record for any percent. Uh-huh. Uh, was done by a runner named Bubai, who beat the game right. in 26 minutes and 29 seconds. That's fucked up. <laughs> in, ga- in game time. That uh, is, that is, wow. Okay. <laughs> like the level of skill that is needed and just like the muscle memory, I feel like, to, to optimize Ooh. this game uh, is wild. Okay. Um, so that. So that's one component of it, right? This game has been featured a couple of times at like uh, SGDQ and other like charity fundraiser events like that, um, and those are those runs are always like super fun to watch because the crowd just like goes nuts. It's it's so good. Um, there is also a category of speed run, uh, which I'm not. I don't know how much you know about. Have you, are you familiar with the concept of a task bot? Uh, I don't know what that is. What is that? Okay, so you you've played um, uh, Super Smash Bros. before, right? Right. You know Rob the robot 
character. Yes. It's based on like an actual toy that Nintendo produced. Um, mm-hmm. Essentially, it is a converted Rob toy, like a computer robot that is supposed mm. to play the game perfectly. Like accounting for the tiny errors and like the milliseconds that uh, like response time that humans are just like not capable of um and so it's a, it's kind of a it's like a unique feature and unique category of speed run that is like completely done by a robot um so the fastest run that i was able to find uh, on youtube um there's not like a world record site that i could find for this one uh was 21 minutes and 59 seconds so like four minutes and some change faster than than the human time which is speed running five mm-hmm. minutes is a lot but it's, it's just it's still very cool I, I geek out a little bit like reading about this kind of stuff um and then yeah this game uh uh one a it, it's funny that we do this right after hades and we talked about like you know this this uh sort of shift where indie games are taken more seriously right um 2018 was a very big year for indie games because of celeste and it won things like score of the year best audio um it was nominated for game of the year uh on several publications and was featured at the games awards in 2018 uh so it's just it's a real good game and if you haven't played it like I I cannot stress enough how wonderful it is. It's a really lovely game, and if you haven't played it, you definitely should check it out. It's worth your time. It has great replay value as well, a great soundtrack. It's just, it has a lot of love in it. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun. It's difficult. It's a difficult game. It kicked my ass (laughs) quite a bit. I got very angry at some parts of it and had to put it down to take a break from it because I was getting angry. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> it's a really good game and it's really fun to play. Mm-hmm. And it's been really nice, like revisiting it. I think we both talked about mm-hmm. like playing it again for this episode. Um, yeah. And like I am determined now to go and find all the secrets and beat the farewell DLC, which I have not done yet. I need to do that too. uh but yeah thank you uh is that is that gonna do it for us here today yeah yeah i think we're good so uh thank you all so much for listening we super appreciate it uh thank you all for the love and patience as uh as we're as we're getting this train back on board yeah it's it's been a month um (laughs) it's super appreciated all of the support and love and yeah we just really appreciate it and thank you so much for listening and we'll see you in the next episode which will come out very very soon heck yeah bye bye hey cuties thanks for listening to our podcast If you liked this episode of Arcade Cuties, be sure to let us know by leaving a review on iTunes, sharing the show with a friend, and leaving a suggestion for future episodes. Make sure to follow us on our social media to stay up to date with our content. We appreciate all the love and support. Until next time, bye cuties! Cuties.